Dear Minister Billström, Ambassador Wendt Danielson, Ambassador Horgan, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you today to the Hattie School because we feel very privileged that you've made time in a very dense schedule to meet with our students and discuss the challenges of security and Sweden's uh, strategy in this very geopolitical times with us today. It is especially a privilege to hear you and your thoughts on security and diplomacy after an intense 20-month struggle over the future of Swedish security that we've all watched intensely. Indeed, it was two weeks ago, on March 7th, that Sweden became the newest member of NATO, marking a great step forward for both Sweden and the NATO alliance. And beyond this exciting news, which I'm sure everybody here is aware about, Sweden also took up the chair for the informal foreign and security cooperation formats of the Nordic and Baltic countries and the Nordic countries at the start of this year. It is a critical time to be having these discussions about security policy, not only given Sweden's recent accession to NATO, but also because of last month's Dakar's anniversaries, the decade since the Russian annexation of Crimea and two years since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. This war has forever changed Europe's security architecture. In Germany, we've given it a name. We called it Zeitenwende, a paradigm shift that has thrown this country into a crisis of purpose. Indeed, policymakers and experts with many questions meet still to chart the way forward. And the happy news around Finland's and Sweden's recent accession to NATO has reminded us of one fundamental truth. It is vital that we start, that we chart these new waters together as an alliance. At the Hattie School, with our 800 students from over 80 countries, we care deeply for these questions, and we work with our partners around the world to learn from other countries' experiences and to learn from one another, whether it is Columbia University in the US or the Stockholm School of Economics, our Swedish partner. As, a European, as the European security changes, uh, changes, as this European security space changes in drastic ways, we're incredibly proud to be contributing to this debate. Our Center for International Security was launched in 2016 to establish a hub for examining the complex security challenges of the 21st century in the heart of the German capital. Conducting research in a range of areas from grand strategy to cyber threats, it is of the utmost importance to us that our work does not remain within the walls of the ivory tower. We want to engage with policymakers and speak to citizens alike in discussions on these topics. We would like to serve as a bridge builder and inform the public debate. So who better to host and listen to his vision for the future of European security than the foreign minister of the most recent NATO member who has fought for a new direction in Swedish security strategy. Tobias Bildström has been serving as Swedish foreign minister since 2022 and previously was the minister for migration and asylum policy from 2006 to 2014 and the group leader of the moderate party in the Swedish Reichstag from 2017 to 2022. We are very much looking forward to hearing your keynote address. And before passing you the microphone, I would just like to say a quick word of thanks. This event came together so well, and no small part due to an excellent coordination with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Stockholm and the Swedish Embassy in Berlin. So a very big thank you to Ambassador Want Danielsen, Abba Litterin, and her team. Additionally, I'm grateful for my excellent colleagues here at the Hattie School who have always so skillfully kept all the threads together in particular our communications team and the staff of our Center for International Security. But now, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Foreign Minister Tobias Bilstrom. Yeah, danke, danke vielmals. Thank you, dear President Wall, dear students, members of uh, the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, indeed a great pleasure to be here at the Hearty School with you today to talk about European security. Um, I've learned that this school's motto is understand today, shape tomorrow. And that would be, I think, a very fitting slogan for the diplomacy of our time uh, as well. The students at Hearty are learning to become shapers. And at this formative stage, I think that this is what we as diplomats need to be as well. 
I would talk about how Sweden navigates at this time of great upheaval um, and how we are actively engaged in uh, shaping and shopping the uh, security in our neighborhood, one which we share, share with Germany and in Europe. The European security order that we built on the hard-won lessons of the Second World War and the Cold War, with Berlin at its epicenter, is under severe attack and the post-Cold War era has come to an end. We must understand today what the far-reaching implications of this fundamentally changed security landscape are. And we must then take action in order to shape our security environment of tomorrow. Since two years, um, all the world knows the word which you used, the Zeitenwende. Uh, and as a neighbor, friend, and uh, now also as an ally, Sweden welcomes Germany's investments in a stronger defense and its substantial support to Ukraine. And I work eminently well with my dear colleague, uh, Frau Annalena Baerbock, on the uh, Russia policy and on EU enlargement. Um, and a high Germany's level of ambition in all those areas is important for Sweden and for all of Europe, as well as for the transatlantic relationship. Sweden has made its own Seitenwende. Since two weeks, we are a proud NATO member. And our membership has strong and broad support in the parliament, as well as in our population. And that is a major strength for Sweden uh, as well as for NATO. Joining NATO is a historic step, a paradigm shift for our country. After more than two centuries of a non military non-alignment, we are entering into a new foreign and security policy identity. At the same time, becoming a NATO member can be seen as a quite natural and final step or of the decades of ever closer partnership with the Alliance since Sweden joined the Partnership for Peace in 1994. The following year we acceded to the EU and for the first time put Swedish troops under NATO command in Bosnia. We have participated in all major NATO peace support operations since, in Kosovo, in Afghanistan and in Libya. We have been a um, golden card partner. We have built uh, interoperability for our armed forces and exchanged assessment on the Baltic Sea region. And now Sweden is fully part of the family in which we belong. We have come home. And I want to express today Sweden's deep gratitude for Germany's strong and consistent support during the accession process. Germany was among the first to ratify Sweden's application on the 8th of July 2022, and also one of the allies who gave us bilateral security assurances in the sensitive period between application and membership. And this we will remember. As you know, Germany and Sweden are closely linked through geography and through history. The economic and cultural ties are strong as of a people-to-people -people contacts. Um, and as an expression of our close contacts, uh, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Victoria, Crown Princess Victoria, was honored to address the Bundestag at uh, Germany's uh, Hochstrauertag last November. In these challenging and dangerous times, the bonds between Germany and Sweden become ever more important uh, as strong democracies we share a firm commitment to the rule of law, to democracy, to human rights. We know that the order of these continents rests on the European Union and NATO. We cooperate closely within the EU and we now also be doing that in NATO. Our mutual defense commitments under Article 5 adds a new existential quality also to our bilateral relations. Sweden will be safer in NATO, and NATO will be stronger with Sweden as an ally. Our alliance policy will be based on solidarity, aiming to enhance security and stability in our neighborhood and the Euro-Atlantic area as a whole. And the same principle underlines our efforts to build security with others 
both in the political alliance, the European Union, and the defense alliance, NATO. Unity, solidarity, and cohesion will be the guiding lights for Sweden as a NATO member. And to safeguard the unity is to safeguard the strength of the alliance. It is a strategic objective for Russia to soar and exploit division within and between EU and NATO members. Sweden will fully share burdens, responsibilities and risks with our allies. And we must invest in our own strength. We have doubled the defense spending the last few years and are now above 2% of GDP. To stand for cohesion also means to stand fully behind NATO's 360 degree approach to security. And this is in line with Sweden's security policy DNA. I mentioned Sweden's record as a contributor to NATO. We also contributed to all the EU's almost 40 crisis management operations in Europe, in the Middle East, in Africa, and in Asia. A broad geographical commitment extends to NATO's engagement with global partners, not at least in the Indo-Pacific. And the security in that region and in the Euro-Atlantic uh, space is closer linked than ever. Also as a NATO member, we will be strongly committed to the EU-NATO cooperation. Continuing to contribute to EU's broad toolbox is a natural cornerstone of Sweden's future security policy. The EU's important role in the transatlantic relations has been amply demonstrated since February 2022. Europe's security needs, as Europe's security needs a strong EU. And in Europe, we need to take a larger responsibility for our own security. To invest in a stronger Europe is also to invest in a durable transatlantic link. While I myself have advocated for Swedish membership in NATO for many years, it was Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine that brought Sweden and Finland into the alliance. And that is the opposite of what Russia intended. As you may know, in December 2021, Russia presented, in terms of an ultimatum, unacceptable demands on a new security order in Europe. One aim was to deny Sweden and countries like Sweden the right to join NATO. Another objective was to push the US and NATO back and in effect, leaving countries close to Russia open to caution. And this Russian objective remains. Sweden's choice for NATO is a sovereign, free, and democratic decision. And that is in itself a victory for freedom and for the invaluable right of every European state to choose its own security arrangements. And our analysis is clear. Russia will remain a serious threat to European security for the foreseeable future. Russia has for a long time demonstrated its willingness to use military means for political objectives. And with the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Russia further lowered its threshold for the use of military force. It is willing to accept high risks, higher than we have seen before, and to accept great losses. It has made a number of miscalculations. Step by step, it has withdrawn from agreements of arms control and confidence-building measures, both conventional and nuclear. And we must plan and prepare for a prolonged confrontation with Russia. We must counter Russia's expansion of power by continuing to constrain its influence, its freedom of action, and ultimately, its ability to do harm. And at the center of our efforts, our firm commitment to standing up for Ukraine's freedom and sovereignty. This is, and will remain, the top priority for Sweden's foreign policy. It is clear what is at stake. Russia is waging war to rebuild an empire and to destroy the European security order, to replace right 
with brutal might. So Ukraine is fighting also for our security and our freedom. And the outcome of the war, which largely depend and will depend on our support, will shape Ukraine and Russia, but also Europe for generations to come. No one desires peace more than Ukraine, whose people suffer the consequences of Russia's brutal aggression. But peace at any cost would only invite further aggression. It is up to Ukraine and to Ukraine only to decide if and when the moment is right to negotiate. And let us never ever lose out of sight that Russia could end the war at any time by withdrawing its troops but it doesn't. So our greatest responsibility today is to provide Ukraine with all the political, the financial, the military support necessary. And the aim is to help Ukraine win the war and to achieve a lasting peace. Now, some argue that supporting Ukraine is costly. Now, let me be crystal clear. Not doing so would be far more expensive. Germany, and Sweden are amongst the most prominent donors. And Sweden will do what is needed to provide as much support as possible to Ukraine. We need both endurance and a strong sense of urgency. And Sweden works closely with Germany and welcome its solid and long-term support for Ukraine, politically, financially, and militarily. EU's decision to open accession negotiation with Ukraine is historic. And EU's enlargement is a EU strategic investment in peace, security, stability, and prosperity. Sweden is a driving force within the EU for harsher sanctions and for restricting Russia's possibilities to fund its war of aggression. We can all do more on enforcement, but make no mistake, the sanctions are having effect. Internal repression in Russia and external aggression against Ukraine go hand in hand. Russia is accelerating the crackdown on civil society, silencing human rights defenders, and any voice opposing the war against Ukraine. The last example is the tragic death of Alexei Navalny, for which the ultimate responsibility lies with the Russian leadership. Sweden, together with 11 member states, have recently proposed that the EU established a sanctions regime specifically designed to address the repression against civil society in Russia. The idea is to receive broad support, and we hope that we quickly can move forward towards its, uh, its adoption. After Finland's and Sweden's accessions, all countries around the Baltic Sea, except Russia, are now members of the alliance. This fundamentally redraws the security map in our part of Europe. Sweden and Finland will allow an increase of NATO's operational depth and the tie, uh, and tie the high north, the North Atlantic and the Baltic regions more closely together. Sweden's geography and military assets can significantly strengthen the alliance's ability to carry out operations in Northern Europe. We will work with our allies to make the best possible use of these assets in support of NATO's deterrence and defense. Sweden will fully harness the opportunities to strengthen the deterrence and defense also of our neighbors, the Nordic and the Baltic states, and to some extent also Germany and Poland. These opportunities are further strengthened by our recently signed bilateral defense cooperation agreement with the US, which goes hand in hand with our NATO membership. It is a sign of unity and facilitates NATO planning that all Nordic states now have signed similar agreements. As Baltic Sea states, we face common challenges and have everything to gain by working together to strengthen the security of the region. Sweden and Finland's accessions creates new opportunities for foreign and security policy cooperation as well. And as chair of the informal Nordic and Nordic-Baltic foreign policy cooperation this year, Sweden will facilitate a di deeper dialogue on regional security issues. 
My Finnish colleague, Ms. Elina Valtonen, and I have also proposed an informal discussion on these topics among the 10 countries, including Germany and Poland, at the margins of the upcoming foreign ministers meeting of the Council of the Baltic Sea States. Germany is an important actor and can play a central role in the security and defense of the whole region. The further engagement from Germany in the Baltic region is in this respect very welcome. The intent to deploy a brigade to Lithuania is a clear signal of Germany's commitment to the region. And I'm convinced that a strong Baltic Sea region, fully anchored in the EU and NATO, is in our shared interest. In this school where we are now, a new generation of uh, shapers of the future for Germany and for Europe is being formed. That is you who are in this room today. Now, I have talked about the building blocks that Sweden sees as most important as we try to shape within our means and together with our partners, the future security in our part of the world. These building blocks, our membership and role in the EU and NATO, a stronger regional cooperation, a long-term Russia policy, the support to Ukraine, are all interlinked. They are individually important, but taken together, they form a greater whole. In this shaping endeavor, Germany will be an indispensable partner for Sweden, bilaterally, regionally, in the EU, and from now on also as allies in NATO. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Bildstrom, for these thoughts, but most of all for all these commitments. There was a lot of um, strong statements that we, of course, welcome as, as German citizens. Many here in the room are not German citizens, but the commitment not just to democracy, the rule of law and human rights, and in many cases, Sweden is a role model for the fight for all of these that uh, many of us admire, but also, and of course, for the commitment to Ukraine and the support that the country needs, I think, are uh, deeply appreciated by many people here in the room. I always have the privilege to ask the first question, but we only have an hour with you. So I want to give that privilege away to the room. I know many of you have come to ask a question, and I know the material here is wide. So I will immediately open it up, and you have to just raise your hand in order to speak. I see two hands here, and I do not know who has the mics, and then I see two over there. We'll group questions, and one of them middle, um, but somebody has to have the mic to get to you. One, we can start immediately here and then move our way through the room. And please present yourself, possibly with your country of origin, to help our minister locate where you're coming from. Thank you very much for giving us your time, Your Excellency. I'm Sebastian from Germany, and um, I would be very interested what the Swedish position is on the possibility of involving NATO ground troops at some point in the Ukraine if the situation deteriorates sufficiently as to make it necessary. If you agree, we'll collect maybe two or three questions. So one was immediately here in the back. If the mic can just go three rows back. Thank you very much. Uh, Benjamin Tallis, German Council on Foreign Relations, a, a Brit living in Germany. Uh, thank you, Minister. Nice to see you here in, in Berlin. Um, you were crystal clear about the stakes involved in the war in Ukraine and why we need to win it. Would you appreciate to hear such clarity from the German government? And while you uh, lay out your response, I'll take one last question. He was in the, in the middle here in the third row. <laughs> We, we will get the mic to you. Uh, thank you, Minister Bellström, for attending. I am Taras, and though I don't sound like it, I am from Sweden. Uh, in the 2024 Utrikes Deklaration, you said that since November 2023, Sweden has provided 250 million kronor to various aid organizations operating in Gaza and recently authorized a 200 million kronor disbursement to UNRWA specifically. 
However, it has been widely reported, including by several organizations that receive Swedish funding, that the Israeli government is significantly restricting the flow of essential humanitarian supplies into Gaza. So my question to you is, what concrete actions is the Swedish government taking to ensure that aid paid for by Swedish taxpayers is actually reaching civilians in Gaza? Thank you. Please take the time to answer. Very good. Thank you very much for the questions. A uh, uh, wide range, but I will try to, to be as brief as possible. Um, to start with uh, the question from, from Sebastian from, from Germany, um, the Swedish government uh, has, of course, observed the proposals being presented lately, most notably by, by the French government and President Macron, to train Ukrainian person on, on Ukrainian soil. However, it is our opinion that, that this is not on the table for, for us. Um, we all need to increase our support to Ukraine, of course, as I said in my statement, militarily, um, also economically and, and, and politically. Uh, and we need to find innovative and rapid ways of increasing that support in itself. So Sweden is quite open to consider different options to adjust the support uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, but on this specific issue, we do not see that as an opportunity at, at the moment. Uh, our British friend, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, we have excellent uh, communications, as I said, and, and cooperation with the, the German government. Uh, and I'm, of course, also here in, in, in Berlin today to have talks with my, with my colleague, uh, the Foreign Minister, uh, Annalena Baerbock. Uh, and, of course, uh, my position here is the one which I will, which I will give her and, and also ask that we, again, try within the EU to become more clear and more, uh, how should we say, unified on the support needed to Ukraine. A long-term support to Ukraine is the only way forward. And of course, we appreciate everyone who takes the floor. I have to say, though, that I think that if I look at what, what uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Minister Baerbock, has said, I uh, don't have very much to complain about. I think that she has always, when she takes the floor in the FIC meetings in Brussels, been very clear that we have to stand on the side of Ukraine and do whatever we can. Um, however, um, we, of course, can always do more, as I just said. Uh, and finally, this is a very good question, because you're quite right. It's not just about allocating money and buy supplies. It's also a question of trying to bring them to those people who are now in dire need in Gaza as we see this humanitarian catastrophe unfold with so many people, especially children, being, being dead and being killed. And Sweden recently made a demarche. Some of you might be familiar with the diplomatic term, but we called on the Israeli government together with a very broad group of EU countries to say that we need more humanitarian access. We called for more opening of um, uh, um, transit um, uh, portals, yeah, exactly, tra transit gates into Gaza, because this is one of the problems. It doesn't do much if you assemble the supplies outside of the border, if you're not able to bring them in to those who need them. There's been a lot of talk about maritime corridors. That's a good thing. Sweden is in favor of this. But it can never replace the land corridors into Gaza. And this is where we need to have an increase. And we need more cooperation from the Israeli government in order for this to, to work out. You do. You can, you can always talk about the need for legitimate security concerns. We appreciate that. But you have to find a balance between that and the time factor because time is now a factor if we are not going to see more people die from famine and starvation. Thank you. Thank you very much for these answers. I'm turning now to the left-hand side. I saw at least, I see three hands, so we'll collect all three. And uh, the question is, when will the mic get to you? So wherever it is and who has it can start. Yes. Hi, my name is Dimitro. I'm a student here at the Hertie School. Uh, first of all, congratulations on joining the NATO family. In your speech to the Swedish Parliament regarding this, you mentioned the long-term need to counteract Russia power expansion, quote, and quote, opportunities to do damage. Today, you've talked about the Russian willingness to accept high losses, their miscalculations, and their lower threshold for use. How do you and the Swedish MFA currently today evaluate the likelihood of direct conventional military confrontation with Russia in the foreseeable future? And let me add the other two hands I saw as well. 
Yes, go ahead, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Julia. I originally come from Hungary and my question is also regarding Hungary. Um, the the reason why accession talks took so long was because Orban kept blocking it. Um, ultimately, he requested uh, personal negotiations with the prime minister and as well as commitments to provide fighter jets to Hungary and um you, you stress the importance of uh, cohesion and sol solidarity within NATO, but uh, how does it make you feel? Are you are you worried about having a member uh, of NATO who is so ambiguous uh, with its commitment to NATO and and also um, doesn't stand up to Russia the way it should? And the last of the this set of questions up in the front, yes. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Maximilian. I'm a German, but I grew up in Hong Kong. And uh, you just called Ukraine the greatest and Sweden's most important foreign policy priority. That is rightly so, but I was wondering how does Sweden view the challenge emanating from China as well and the increasing violations of, of the international order that come with it? Thank you very much. A new set of topics, floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was just going to say, once again, a broad range of, of uh, issues. Um, to start with, uh, the question from uh, Dimitro, was it uh, right? Sorry, I didn't... Yeah, thank you. Sorry. I was getting the, the name right. As I said, we need to have a long-term policy uh, for Russia from the EU side, from NATO side. We have to understand that we are in for a long period of confrontation with Russia. And we cannot rule out that the, since the long-term aim of Russia laid down, as I said, already in 2008, perhaps at, at, at uh, President Putin's speech at the Munich Security Conference, where he spoke about the need to establish spheres of interests and spoke about the, uh, the <laughs> Vienna Conference being the, yeah, the peak of diplomacy, where big states sit down at the table carving up the world and allocating places for smaller states. Something which, in my view, and the view of the Swedish government, is exactly opposite to the view which we take, namely that we live in a multilateral society after the Second World War with the establishment of the UN Charter and going back to those dark days where bigger states told smaller states is a return to, 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 uh, to the past. So understanding this, and understanding that the letters being sent in 2021 by Sergei Lavrov on, on, the, uh, on the, the bidding of his master, Putin, uh, where he said a lot of things about security spheres again, means that Russia really wants to recreate its empire. It's actually quite interesting when you look at the coat of the arms. I don't know if you have noticed that, which President Putin sits under when he gives his speeches. If you look in that coat of arms, which is the old Russian imperial coat of arms, you see smaller coats of arms. Have you noticed them? They are the coat of arms of Finland, of Lithuania, of Poland. So if you ever want to understand what Russia has for long-term ambitions, you can just look at that coat of arms and understand what this is all about. So again, coming back to the question, long-term confrontation, and I don't rule out that Russia will try and test NATO and test us on certain issues. And we can already see that happening in some cases. We can just look at the missiles sometimes dropping down in Poland as one of the examples, or the way that Russian fighter pilots behave over the Baltic Sea when they fl fly closer in reckless maneuvers against not only NATO planes, but also Swedish planes before we entered NATO. So I think you get the, you get the picture. Um, on Hungary, well, um, I have said it before and I say it again. Um, there is a difference between Turkey and Hungary. Uh, with Turkey in 2022, when we uh, handed in our letter of, of intent to join NATO, uh, Turkey voiced uh, issues with Sweden, issues regarding uh, their security uh, and the threat of terrorism, which we took seriously. There was a, a clear memorandum written down, and the point here is that Turkey was very clear on what they wanted, what they, they, they had to to ask for. There was no, no such thing coming forward from Hungary. 
Uh, and at the end of the day, Hungary made a lot of promises that they wouldn't be the last, and yet they became last to, to ratify us. However, this is now in the past. We have entered, and of course, it was a bonus that they bought another four Gripen air fighters. I said that NATO is truly a wonderful organization. We even get paid by its members to join. It's a good thing. So we don't really have a beef in that regard with, with Hungary. Uh, and as for the criticism uh, that has been voiced uh, the, with uh, Hungary under Article 7, that is in the hand of the Commission. And like all other member states, we stand behind the Commission in that criticism. And finally then, uh, Maximilian, was it? Very good. You're quite right. And I would like to elaborate a bit shortly on this, this subject. We make Ukraine, as I said, our first and most important foreign policy uh, objective. But within that, there is a broader story, which is being told uh, by what is happening in the Indo-Pacific. If Ukraine were to fall and Russia were to win, that would open up the floodgate for other countries, other authoritarian countries, who think that if you can use power in the way Russia does with success in Ukraine, why shouldn't we do the same? And this is the big risk about Ukraine, that it is actually the first domino that could fall uh, in, in a series. Um, and that means also that if we want other countries, most notably the United States, to be interested in what is going on in Ukraine, global partners and the US, we need to be interested in what they think is important. So we should direct interest to the Indo-Pacific. And we do that. And we think, Sweden thinks, that NATO also should be concerned with what is going on in the Indo-Pacific. That doesn't mean that we should allocate neither military means or, or material. The US is quite capable of handling that in, on their own. But we need to divert political interest to what is going on in that region and understand that China's assertiveness and China's ambitions in the Indo-Pacific has an impact on what is going on in Europe as well. And this would be a policy for Sweden within NATO as well, to be clear. Sorry for the lengthy answer, but this was a very important question and, and you're right. I should have been clear on connecting these two. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I see a lot of hands. We have five minutes and I will keep the time because uh, our our guest will have to leave by 50 at the very latest. Uh, so I will take two very short questions. And in order to decide who will get them, I will make it the where it gets the mic first. So just give it to somebody who has their hand up. <laughs> or we can throw it like in a baseball game and uh, you can then give it up. Um, Johannes, short question. Um, also here from Hertie School, um, short question to the Baltic Sea again. Um, we talked about land bridges, but the Suvalki gap is pretty small. So how can we um, do also maritime logistics to support our um, Baltic partner? I think Sweden um, plays a big role for that. And second, also within the um, democracies, uh, we are attacked by... Um, um, by opponents um, also at the ballot um, coming up the European elections um, how can we foster unity within our democracies okay one one more question although you snuck in a second I noticed but it's fine <laughs> and here's uh, the last question hi there um, Aaron Burnett <laughs> Sorry. and and okay you both have a mic, uh, gender balance, one short question, last okay. question. I'll try and be as quick as possible. Uh, Aaron Burnett, German-Canadian living uh, here uh, in Berlin. Um, uh, Canadian legislation along with American and uh, Swiss actually is at a very advanced stage in draft legislation for the seizure of Russian assets, 300 billion in frozen central bank reserves. So far, the European Union has only agreed to use the interest on those assets to help Ukraine. What do you think is the next step to finding some agreement uh, on this particular issue? Thank you very much. Final question in the back. Hello, um, my name is Samantha, I'm American, and I have um, just a quick question about um, Sweden's thoughts on the upcoming American election um, with a potential President Trump again, um, the US's unfortunate withdrawal on the global scale. Very easy question, I know, but thank you. <laughs> and you can use the time to give short answers or not answer whichever uh, question you prefer. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, I will try to be as brief as, as, uh, as possible. Uh, the question about... Uh, um, 
helping, you know, with the, the, I mean, there are a lot of military complexities in this region, so I'm not going to go too far into that. I will just limit myself to saying, with the Swedish Navy on board, which has capabilities, not at least submarines, uh, and five of them uh, soon, uh, is, is a, a very important contribution to the security and the, the deterrence and the defense in the Baltic Sea region. And it will be enable support to be handed given to the Baltic states in case of an emergency in a much different way than what was the case before Sweden joined NATO. So this is a major shift, again, of EU political importance to this, to this region. Um, as for the question uh, from Aaron, was it right? Um, it's true, the EU has so far talked only of the windfall, the interest, as you say, from, from this, um, the, the, the revenue that can be put in. We are not averse to continue the discussion the important thing here is to take in the legal difficulties. We don't want question, we, we don't want um, instruments uh, amounting to confiscation to find its way into our normal practice. And to find a balance between this so that you do not, um, how should we say, encourage the discussion of, of the right to confiscating uh, assets. Uh, to, to, make, to, to make headway with that. I think it's important, but we should continue the discussion in the EU. And at the end of the day, of course, there is a legitimate right from Ukraine to ask for compensation from Russia. And the form of that compensation remains open to questions. I'll limit myself to that. Um, as for the US elections, yeah, I, I, I suspect I could sit here for another 20 minutes or something just by talking of so, some aspects of this. But um, I, I'll, I'll say the following. We have to be prepared to work with any administration of those who are now uh, uh, waging uh, uh, or fighting for, for in, 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 uh, an election campaign. Uh, regardless of who sits in the White House, however, I sometimes think that in the European Union and uh, Europe as a, as a whole, we overlook the importance of the Senate. Uh, we sometimes think that it is only the White House who decides everything in the US, and that is a big mistake. Uh, and I've seen close up now in my connections and my, uh, my, my discussions with senators how bipartisan the US actually can be even at this stage, especially on Sweden's NATO accession, where there's clear bipartisanship and a strong support from both the Democrats and the Republicans. And that says something about the bigger story on NATO as well. There's been a lot of talk recently on the 2% goal and, and um, how, how former President Trump worded things. I saw that he, in a way, retracted a bit from his four previous statements. However, we are again making a big mistake if we think that the criticism about not all countries in the NATO family achieving 2% is something emanating out of a Trump campaign. That is not true. That has been voiced for many decades by uh, U.S. politicians and by U.S. presidents. And again, me being a Swede, we think that one should pay your bills uh, at, at, um, in time and not be overdue. And we will be champions for the idea that all countries should fulfill the 2% goal, just as we are doing it. That was perhaps also an important thing in my, my speech. If we are preparing for this long-term confrontation with Russia, which we think is at hand, we also have to do a job. All of us have to do the job, that regardless of who sits in the White House. Thank you. Thank you for these clear words and for the Swedish punctuality. We are exactly on time and uh, I wanted to keep one or two minutes so that the only moment we allow a flag carrying that the Swedish students in the room can come up and speak with their foreign minister, maybe get a small picture, but we will be out of that door in exactly two minutes. So make sure you make your way fast so you can oh, shake hands. Swedish. And then, <laughs> yes, it's our question.